This is a brand new study. This is really important because, and as I'll speak to in just a moment, I'm very interested in the idea of prevention. Because this is such a new area, there's been very few, well, there's been no intervention trials so far up until this, which was just published. So many of you will have heard of the PREDIMED study, the results of which were published in the New England Journal of Medicine to great fanfare about three months ago. And this was a very large scale multi-centre trial in Spain putting people on either the traditional low-fat dietary recommendation or one of two forms of a Mediterranean diet, one with extra olive oil, one with extra nuts. The trial was stopped early because they showed such profound evidence of impact on cardiovascular events in that those in the dietary, the Mediterranean type, uh, diet groups were doing a hell of a lot better than the others in terms of their cardiovascular outcomes. But my colleagues in Spain, Almedina Sanchez Villagas, they looked at depression. Now they weren't powered statistically to look at depression. You need huge sample sizes to look at new cases of depression, you know, between 10,000, 20,000 people. They only had three or 4,000. But what they did was removed everybody who'd already had depression at some point, and then just looked at the impact of these uh, diets, different diets, on the risk for new depression. and. What they showed was, and this is the, the study just uh, published in BMC Medicine, that there was pretty clear evidence for the uh, Mediterranean diet with nuts to reduce the incidence of new depression, even though the confidence interval just spanned one, and particularly in those with type 2 diabetes. They reduced the incidence by close to 40%. So this is the first time where we're seeing dietary modification, dietary improvement can prevent new cases of depression. Now this has obvious implications for recurrence, reducing recurrence. And contrary, and of course we see with people with severe um, psychiatric illnesses, I think a lot of clinicians think, well, they're not gonna change their diet, they're not gonna stop eating rubbish and they're not gonna stop smoking, etc." But actually what we know from primary care and people in depression in primary care is that they're actually really keen to make these changes because this is something that is under their own volition. Unlike all of these other things in their life that they can't control, this is something that may give them some relief and that is under their own volition. And in fact, the big diamond study that Professor Jane Gunn has been conducting of depression in primary care, approximately 30% of people with depression reported that they'd improved their diet in an attempt to feel better. Instinctively, they felt that if they improved their physical health, their mental health would also improve. And there's actually quite a lot of data suggesting that people who've had depression are actually eating better than ones who haven't had depression. So I think it's important to, to recognise that we can actually make a difference by making these recommendations, these very clear recommendations. <laughs> And the interesting thing with this study is that even in this study, the de degree of adherence wasn't large, but a lot of that was to do with the fact that um, a lot of them already were eating pretty well. So they weren't actually modifying their diets a huge amount. So the fact that we still saw that is really, really interesting and compelling. This is really important. We know that depression in particular, we know the kindling model of depression. So once you've got subsyndromal depressive symptoms, you are about four and a half times more likely to develop a major depressive episode over the course of a year. Once you've had one episode, you're even more likely to have another. Once you've had two, you're even more likely to have another. So it seems to be this cyclical kindling process. We think this feeds into it because at the top, you've got poor lifestyle. And unfortunately, this is really common. And this is why SES doesn't explain these links. And that's because everybody's eating badly, absolutely everyone. So in all the population surveys across Australia, about 10% of women and about 5% of men adhere to even just the basic healthy eating guidelines of two fruit and five veg a day. Everybody's eating really poorly because these uh, food products are ubiquitous, they're highly convenient, they're really cheap, they're highly addictive, they're everywhere you go, you can't even fill up your car without being assaulted by a, a whole shelf full of them. So people are eating really badly. Only about 30% of people are exercising in the way that they need to for health. Um, and we still have smoking rates that are fairly persistently above 10% of the population. So poor lifestyle is really 
very common. We're talking just about diet here. So we're talking specifically about the impacts of that on inflammation, oxidative stress, reduced BDNF and nutritional deficiencies, which have a big impact on gene expression. That increases the risk for depression. However, it also means then it's much harder to recover because when you're sick, you get worse off, as we've just seen. So your nutrient levels go down even more. Your omega-3 fatty acid levels are reduced. Harder to get better. You tend to get poorer self-care, which of course feeds into this, which keeps that whole cycle going. So this is really the model. Non-communicable diseases and uh, common mental disorders, we know they're highly comorbid with a vast array of shared pathophysiological factors, mainly inflammation, oxidative stress. They're primary, the ones we're looking at. Lifestyle behaviours, so we're talking diet, physical activity and smoking, feed into both of them. So whilst there can be no health without mental health, we're saying the opposite is also true and really needs to be taken into account. Now these are the WHO causes of NCD framework where you're looking at all these socioeconomic, cultural, political and environmental determinants, primarily globalisation as well as urbanisation and an ageing population. This feeds into unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, tobacco use, and of course, this again feeds into raised blood pressure, raised blood glucose, blood lipids, overweight, obesity, which leads into all these NCDs. But actually, we can add common mental disorders here, and particularly if we add here HPA axis dysfunction, uh, inflammation and oxidative stress, BDNF, etc. And then there's this bi-directional relationship between these two here. So we can start to think about universal prevention programs. In psychiatry, unlike the rest of medicine, we only have indicated and selected prevention programs. So people who are at high risk already have some symptoms where you can apply psychotherapeutic approaches in, a, in an attempt to, to reduce uh, recurrence or the new onset. And they actually do have utility. We've seen particularly, you can even use the internet and there's a lot of work being done by, you know, Gavin Andrews and the Black Dog, etc., looking at that. But before, we've never really had targets for universal population level prevention in the same way that with NCDs, everybody knows that if you eat badly and you don't exercise and you smoke, then you're at risk of disease. In the UK, as in elsewhere in the West, we've seen since the 1980s a really pronounced reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality. Prior to that, it looked like this. It was going up, 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 and then it went down, down, down. Now the primary reason for that is twofold. One is there's early screening and uh, things such as statins, but the main thing is reductions in smoking rates in the West. That's the main reason. About 50% of this decline is because smoking rates have declined. When we look at what it took to get smoking rates to decline, it took so much work from the 1980s, nearly all of it legislative, nearly all of it policy around taxation, public health messages, you're not allowed to smoke here, you can't work in the, smoke in the workplace, health warnings, uh, changing the age at which people can buy cigarettes, addressing tobacco sponsorship, etc. Took a massive amount of work, but it's actually been really effective. Our smoking rates are so much lower than they are in other countries. I spent a lot of time in Japan and they're still up at around 40%. We have a 400% markup, tax markup on cigarettes in Australia. Now we can't even get a 10% tax on soft drink. Not that a 10% tax would make much difference because people would just buy fewer fruits and vegetables and still drink soft drink because it's really addictive. <laughs> Dr. Margaret Chan, there was one of only two high level meetings, like really, this is a you know, global emergency, we must do something at the United Nations in, um, in America in September 2011. So we must address non-communicable diseases because it's going to cost upwards of $30 trillion over the next 15 odd years. And there is no country in the world that can afford it. The absolute scale, the tidal wave of um, poor health that is coming primarily from changes to the food system. This responsibility for change must fall on the heads of state because the problem is too big and too broadly based to be addressed by any single government ministry and because the rise of these diseases is being driven by powerful universal forces, which is corporations. 
Rob Moody now just calls them straight out. Pointless even trying to engage with them because their strategies, the way that they undermine the public health messages is so successful but so well known and we cannot afford to, to wait any longer. We must address through legislation and policy in the same way that we did with tobacco.